Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. At 16 years old, our next guest was tried as an adult and slapped with a life sentence for killing a 43-year-old man who solicited her for sex. Over the years, her story would hit news headlines and spur public outcry, social media campaigns, and pressure from high-profile celebrities like Rihanna and Kim Kardashian. The push eventually worked, and after 15 years behind bars, then-Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam granted her clemency and set her release date for August 7th, 2019. Now, with years of abuse and isolation behind her and love and light on her side, she's making the most of her freedom, advocating for sex trafficking victims across the country and pinning a new memoir, Free Centoya, My Search for Redemption in the American Prison System. We've been covering her story for quite some time, actually the inception of Sister Circle, and we're so happy to have her join us today. Please welcome down to the circle, Centoya Brown Long. Yes! yes. We're so happy to have you here yes, today. Thank yes. you so much. Thank Look you so much. Look, and she's absolutely gorgeous. Just gorgeous. Thank yes, you. absolutely. <laughs> now, you've been on a whirlwind, obviously, on press runs, a new marriage. Have you ever just sat down and thought about, how am I adjusting to life after prison? And how, how are you adjusting? You know, I'm blessed. Um, it's, it's been very seamless for me. I've been blessed. I have an incredible support system. I'm um, an incredible husband. Yes, look at that smile. And, <laughs> you know, it's I've I've just been really blessed. Yeah, absolutely. You look blessed too. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. And we're blessed to have you. Yes. Um, but let's just talk about um, you know, let's just talk about let's just get into this whole situation. So, um, from birth you kind of fought against the odds, you know, as a young girl anyway. Your mom um, was an alcoholic, she also went through sex trafficking. Um, and, and I guess if anyone wants to look at your story, they would think that you were destined for that same outcome. Um, but God, mm -hmm. um, what I want to know is, did you ever have resentment for your mom? Do you feel like she didn't pray that generational curse off of you and someone didn't pray that generational curse off of her? Did you ever feel that way when you were in jail? You know, for a while, uh, my biological mother is who you're referring to. Yes. And you know, for a while I did. Um, and that was after I had met her. I didn't meet her until I was 16 years old. Okay. And it was it was very frustrating to see that she was still exhibiting the same behaviors wow. that, you know, forced her to be in a position where she couldn't take care of me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm blessed with the family that I was put with. You mm -hmm. just showed my mother, Elanette. Um, she was there for me from the very beginning, has never left my side to this day, mm -hmm. and just just really helped me get through everything. I know there was a time where I felt, you know, why do I keep making all these mistakes? Am I destined to become, you know, this other woman? And, you know, it's, it's just not true, and so I was blessed to have somebody that raised me to be who I am today. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, go back to your 16-year-old self. Obviously, you were dealing with so much um, abuse, uh, neglect, feeling misguided, um, and then you're in prison. How did you remain hopeful, or did you remain hopeful with the outcome or the outlook looking so bleak for you? You know, from the moment that they told me that I would do life in prison, I did not accept it. Okay. I had never believed it. There was always something telling me, you know, that I wasn't gonna spend the rest of my life in prison. But for a while, my faith did. It did wither, and you know, I have to credit my husband with pulling me back to that place where, you know, I started to believe that we serve a God, not only of second chances, but of miracles. Yes. And, you know, I started to develop a relationship with him, and then I started seeing things changing. Mm. And so then it became real, like, okay, this is really going to happen. Wow. Wow. And when you were in prison and you found God and, this, and you started to establish a relationship with him, was that the moment where, or did you ever feel like, first of all, did you ever have anger, well, obviously anger, throughout your prison term, and was it when you found God that that kind of turned around for you? It was. I did struggle with anger a lot of the time. Um, it came from being trapped, of feeling powerless. And, you know, when I started, I was raised in the church, mm -hmm. but what I knew was religion. Mm -hmm. And when I started trying to find, you know, hope in, in that religion, I, I just kept coming up short. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I developed a relationship, it wasn't until I started learning about Jesus and his own plight with injustice mm -hmm. and how, you know, there, there's mercy for me 
that there can be redemption for me that things started changing. I started being able to forgive myself. I started looking at my situation, not of me being trapped, but I was just in the middle of a trial and I knew he would deliver me. And it absolutely helped me to yes. turn things around. Yes. There's so many women and girls who are, you know, are dealing with similar situations mm -hmm. like yours. And when you were given that second chance, was there a part of you that felt guilty for being released? You know, I didn't feel guilty. I felt that, you know, the Lord had chosen me to be a voice. He had chosen mm -hmm. me to be an example. And, you know, I just, I just feel that, that there's opportunity here. Mm -hmm. And I just feel blessed to have been chosen. Yeah. And so. you know, you, you also um, apologized to the family of the man who you shot. What point, at what point did you get to that place where you say, you know what, this is something that I need to do? And you why? Know, yeah, so the thing is, they did absolutely nothing. I have never, you know, met these individuals before that night. And regardless of the circumstances, this is a family who's absolutely blameless and, and they're the ones who are left and they're really suffering to this day. So I can't help but have compassion. I don't see how anybody couldn't have compassion for, for someone who's, who's experienced that. Mm -hmm. Would you ever, um what would you say to them if you had the chance to, to sit down with them one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I had already said that, you know, if they ever wanted to talk with me, I would absolutely be willing to do that. You know, everyone is different yes. in, in how they process things and, and things that they're open to, but I would really be open to that. And I just want them to know that if, if they never get the chance to talk to me, ask me any questions, that they should know that I am dedicated to living my life in a way that prevents other people mm -hmm. from going through the same thing that they've went through. Yes. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot more to talk to with Centoya Brown Long, including her new memoir and more about her lovely marriage. Stay with us. Come look at this basket. What do you see in here? Oh man, they just gave you some baby clothes <laughs> thinking we got a baby on the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this has see? gotten out of control. Come on. <laughs> I'm not pregnant. I'm just fat. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, we are back <laughs> with author, advocate, speaker, and survivor, Centoya survivor, Brown Long. That's very cute. That is cute. <laughs> and it's fun. To, it's good to be able to see you laugh and joke mm -hmm. about being pregnant and fat girl. Because I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> the women out here today, we have a time when I wait. <laughs> so it's good. It's good. And speaking of your body, um, it's, it's, it's interesting based on what you went through to get in jail mm -hmm. could put you in a predicament where you ha you feel a way about your body. Mm -hmm. At what point were you starting to begin to become comfortable with your body enough even to find the love of your life mm -hmm. and, and be okay with marrying someone? Mm -hmm. You know, I really had to take ownership of my body. So whenever you undergo sexual trauma, when you mm -hmm. have someone who is you know, misusing you and abusing yes. you, it's like you don't have power over what happens to yourself, to your body, and I, a lot of the anger I realized was coming from, from that, and yeah. it was like, I'm not gonna continue to allow people from the past to have that control over my life. Yes. Yes. I had to see that every man is not the man that, that I knew before, right. mm -hmm. and I had to open myself up to understanding that God's gonna put people in my life, yeah. um, and these aren't gonna be the same people from before, and I can't, block my blessing by carrying all of that baggage yeah. my with goodness. me. Yeah. Women, so. women in general should have that same philosophy. And speaking of what you went through and, and, and your faith in God, it was a scripture um, that you have in your book, it's Psalms. Mm -hmm. And I, when I read it today, I was speaking with Rashawn Ali about it as well. <laughs> um, it's Psalm 71, mm -hmm. is that it? Um, where is this scripture, child? <laughs> she knows the scripture. It's, it's, it's I, the scripture. And you, Lord, oh, I have oh, here it is. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Now, the scripture says, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Mm -hmm. When I read that this morning, it just, it struck me because if I'm to be, if I'm not to be mistaken, that is David saying to God, the tr I know that you will put me through troubles, but then you will revive me. So you were telling me during the break that you started to really embody the scripture 
in the last two years, you and your husband. Tell us about that. Tell us how you, you got through with this scripture. So whenever I met my husband, you know, he really started helping me to walk through a lot of the questions, a lot of the anger that I had felt um, towards God. Mm -hmm. And our minister, Pastor Tim McGee, had given us that scripture for me to read. And I read that scripture seven times mm. every single day. And he wow. said, you read this seven times a day until you get out of prison because wow, God's wow. going to deliver you. Yes. My God. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And, you know, it brought to mind the story of Job, how, you know, God allowed the enemy to test him. Yes. But he always had a plan to restore him with Joseph. You know, yes. everything that Joseph went through, God had a plan to elevate him. Yes. And I think that, you know, with me, I read that scripture and I felt, you know, this shows me that even though I've been through everything I've been through, I know that God is working it out for my mm, good. Yes. I know that he has a plan. I can't see it right now. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I trust it because I've seen him do it time and time again. Mm. And I know what he did for them, he'll do for me too. Yes, my amen. God. Amen. amen. That is beautiful. That is gorgeous. Let's talk a little bit about the memoir and what you yes. want people to take away from this book. You know, this book has something for everyone. If you have a young person in your life, as a woman, some of the experiences that you've you've gone through, you may be able to relate to. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in learning more about the justice system, I offer a complete and very detailed look into my own experience on through the juvenile court system, yes. the adult system, and the prison system, and the appellate system. Hey. So there's there's something for everyone, and most especially for anyone who's lost their faith along the way. Anybody who's ever questioned, you know, is there someone up there listening to me? I question the same thing. Yes. And if you can see how he spoke to me, I hope that it speaks to you in some way too. Mm. Oh my gosh. What is the response um, to those who view your clemency as a mismanagement of the judicial system? You know, I think that it's really important for us to understand, you know, clemency is an act of mercy. Mm -hmm. And I always think back to this, this verse in Luke where, you know, Jesus had went and he was standing before, you know, all of these people. And here was this man that comes and says, you know, please help me. His, his hand is withered. His right hand has always been seen as a, a source of strength. Mm -hmm. And it was on the Sabbath. And so you have the Pharisees saying that you can't do this because, you know, our convention teaches us, our interpretations of what the Bible says teaches us that this is not, this is not okay for this day. But he says, you know what, I'm not going to allow convention, I'm not going to allow our interpretations um, to continue to allow this man to suffer. And so what the governor did is he said, I'm going to have compassion on this individual. Yes. And I'm going to say that 51 years is too extreme. I personally believe 51 years is too long for anyone. And... I've served 15 years. I've done my sentence. That's the same amount of time that someone convicted of second degree murder would serve. I'm still convicted. So I haven't been let off or anything. I've been held accountable and I've served my time. Yeah. Right. Is ministry in your future? Okay. Oh, because the way you are delivering these words <laughs> is so beautiful. Have you thought about that? Or do you think what you're doing is your pulpit? Mm, good, I do think that, you know, what I'm doing now is every single day I wake up, my husband and I, we thank God just for us being here and we ask him to guide us. So whatever he has me to do, that's what I do. Any, any, any kind of conversation that I'm having, I always try to tell, you know, what he's done for me. And that doesn't matter what platform it's on. Mm -hmm. So yes, one last question: What would you say to 16-year-old Centoya Brown? You know, I would just have to look at her and let her know that she is going to make it. There were so many times when you know I felt that the things were over. I didn't, I didn't see the other side of the situation that I was in. But you know, there is a way out. There are people who can help you. Um, but most of all, there's a God in heaven who loves you just as you are. Yes. And you don't have to give of yourself in the ways that you learn to give of yourself in ways before to be accepted. You don't have to do all that. Just know that he loves you and he's going to get you through it. My God, you are a remarkable woman. Human. Thank My you. God. My God. We are very honored yes. to be in your space and in your presence. Aww. And I know that you've saved so many lives yes. by people watching today mm -hmm. and will continue to do so. We're grateful for you. Yes. But most importantly, God loves you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. Can we give it up for the Yay. lovely Centoya Brown Long? 
Make sure you get her book, Free Centoya, My Search for Redemption in the American Prison System, wherever fine books are sold. And to keep up with Centoya's advocacy work, book tour, her book tour stops, and much more, you can follow her on Instagram at Centoya Brown Official. For those who are in ATL, she's speaking at Clark University at 6 p.m. tonight.